Thank you for joining me again in Praying the Bible. In previous episodes, we've looked at how to pray through Psalms, how to pray through a New Testament letter. Today, we're going to look in John chapter 5 as an example of how to pray through a narrative passage of Scripture, a story. And this is important because, well, narrative is the biggest chunk of our Bible. For example, so much of the Old Testament is narrative. The Gospels are largely narrative. The Book of Acts, so much of that is narrative. But there's one big difference in praying a narrative passage of Scripture and in what we've done thus far. Thus far, we've looked at the text microscopically. We read, for example, in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and in those five words, we prayed at great length. In 1 Thessalonians 2, in that New Testament letter, we saw even between the commas, we saw matter for prayer. But now in a narrative passage, you don't look at that microscopically in the same way. Rather, we have to back up and get the big picture. Because if you try to pray microscopically over a passage like the one we're going to look at today in John chapter 5, well, it would look like this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Well, <laughs> what do you pray about that? If you were forced to come up with something, you might pray about some feast, or maybe you feasted too much and you need to confess that, but it wouldn't be easy, would it? No, in a narrative passage, you're going to back up and, and look at the whole story. In this case, probably the entire nine verses of this story that begins John chapter 5. And you'll pray about the big, broad brush strokes here. Because see, in a narrative passage of Scripture, you usually have these stage-setting verses after which comes the punchline. It may only be the, the punchline you'll pray about in a narrative passage of Scripture. And so if I were to try to pray through John chapter 5 today, it might look something like this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And what may strike me only at that point is the idea of someone that I may know who has suffered with some disability, who has been an invalid in some way or some long-suffering person for many, many years like this, and the realization that I have not prayed for that person and their disability in so long because I've rather accepted it. I've grown used to the fact that that's the way they are. And it's not crossed my mind to pray for them in an ongoing way. Then, after that, I look at the text again where it says Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? This might prompt me to ask confession for my lack of sensitivity, unlike Jesus who showed mercy on this man who knew he had been there a long time, but yet Jesus showed mercy on him, whereas I may only show indifference towards certain people and ask forgiveness for that. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one, and it, and it goes on. And this illustrates the fact that many times there will be verses in a passage you don't know what they mean. But it's okay to go ahead and go on to another verse that you do understand. Or maybe you understand the next verse perfectly, like some of these, but they just don't prompt you to pray about anything. So there's nothing that says you have to pray over every verse. There's nothing that says you must find something in every verse. Indeed, a narrative passage illustrates clearly that there may be just the big ideas here and there in a passage of Scripture and that it's okay to pray in those situations. So you don't have to know everything that a passage means to pray the Bible. Pray those things that you do understand. Pray whatever comes to mind as you're going through the text because everything that comes to our minds are things we should bring to God. This is taking the Bible and turning Godward every thought that occurs to us as we read the Bible. You can do that. Let me encourage you to do that in your daily praying. 
Try that in John chapter 5, and I hope you'll take these principles, these simple, permanent, biblical solutions to the problem of saying the same old things about the same old things. Take these simple things, try them in your life, and I can't emphasize enough the necessity of actually trying this. If you just hear me talk about these things, it will not have the impact that praying the Bible yourself will have. So I plead with you, if you've not done it thus far, in this last video, I plead with you to try praying the Bible. Thank you for watching.